Okay, hi everybody. So today we're going to continue talking about the power magnet, which is what we looked at last time. So let me quick you, quickly remind you what we saw about the power magnet last time. So it's a very simple system, which is made up of spins, where each spin either points up or down, and the energy of each spin is decided solely by its interaction with an external magnetic field, which we call H. Okay. So that's the only interaction is between the spin and the magnetic field. The spins can only point up or down. Okay. Now, last time we calculated the entropy of this, which depends only upon the magnetization, and the formula we found was the following. Remember, entropy is defined as the Boltzmann constant times the log of the number of ways of arranging the system with that magnetization. So this turns out to be KBN over 2 times 2 log 2 minus 1 plus M log 1 plus M minus 1 minus M log 1 minus M. I mean, you've got all these formulas in your notes, so you don't necessarily have to write them again. But we can plot this then. A graph of entropy is a function of magnetization. And it looks something like this. It's entropy is highest when the magnetization is zero, and entropy goes to zero when the magnetization goes to one. Something like this. Okay? And remember, in terms of energy, Magnetization equals 1 is a low energy state, right? So this is low energy here, and this is high energy here. The opposite direction to the magnetization. Okay? We also calculated the temperature. Okay, so let me say. S is defined as Boltzmann constant times the log of the number of ways of arranging the system. The temperature... is defined as in statistical physics, 1 over t is equal to the derivative of entropy with respect to energy, okay? when you do no work. Okay. So in this case, that just means a constant field. Okay. And we found from this the temperature, which we also got last time. So if I write down the equation from the notes last time, the temperature of the system is equal to 2 mu h, that's just the interaction of a spin with the field, divided by the Boltzmann constant times the log of 1 plus m over 1 minus m. So this gives you the temperature as a function of magnetization. And again, we can draw a graph, which I did last time. And if you draw a graph of this one, it looks something like this. So as you'd expect, remember, this is low energy and this is high energy. So low energy states correspond to low temperature. High energy states correspond to high temperature. So what we're going to start by doing today is to take this formula, this formula for the temperature, and look at some more consequences of it. Okay? Because there are some interesting things we can say about this result, which allows us to make some physical predictions. Okay. Now, this is actually the content of the Worksheet 5, Question 1, which I gave you last time. Worksheet 5, Question 1 is all about taking this formula and seeing some consequences. So I'm basically just going to work through that question on the worksheet now. this next 20 minutes or so is going to be solving this question on the worksheet. Okay, the first part, A, simply says, take this formula and make M the subject. In other words, make this formula M equals something. Okay, now this is just math. It's just rearranging math, so I'll just do it quickly. First of all, we have that log 1 plus M over 1 minus M is equal to 2 mu h over kbt. 
So okay, now if I exponentiate this, I get that 1 plus m is equal to e to the 2 mu h over kbt times 1 minus m. That's just exponentiating and multiplying by 1 minus m. Okay, then I can group the terms in m together. So this means that m 1 plus e to the 2 mu h over kbt is equal to e to the 2 mu h over kbt minus 1 from there. And then finally, I divide to make n the subject. m is equal to e to the 2 mu h over kt minus 1 over e to the 2 mu h over kt plus 1. Okay, that's, that's the result. Um, the question asks you to write it in terms of a hyperbolic tangent function. So to do this, you just multiply top and bottom by e to the minus mu h over kbt. And this gives you e to the mu h over kbt minus e to the minus mu h over kbt divided by e to the mu h over kbt plus e to the minus mu h over kbt. If you can't read these things in the exponent, they're all the same. They're all mu h over kbt. Right, okay. So in conclusion, and this is exactly the hyperbolic tangent function, so we get the result that m is equal to tan hyperbolic tangent mu h over kb times t. Okay, so that's our first result. And we can draw a picture of this. It's basically just this picture turned on its side. But we can plot a picture now. This is the magnetization of the function of field for fixed temperature greater than zero. This is just a tanch function. And Hopefully you know what the tangent function looks like. It takes values between minus 1 and 1. And it's asymptotic to minus 1 as m goes to minus infinity. Then it goes up and asymptotic to 1 as m goes to infinity. Okay. I can also draw a graph of how does the temperature depend upon magnetization. And then this is, as I said, just the inverse of what was written there. So it looks something like this. Again, it takes values between 1 and minus 1. And this is the pic picture for fixed field, again positive. OK, so some interesting things we can note about these graphs. First of all, if h is equal to 0, then the magnetization is 0. This makes sense. This means that if there's no field, then the spins are just random. Half of them point up and half of them point down. If there's no field, the spins are just in random directions. As I increase the field, as I increase the field up, more and more spins start to point up, which is what you'd expect. Right? So at temperature equals zero, the spins are all in random directions. As I increase the field, the strength of the field, they start to a few more start to point up. And if I make the field very, very strong, then virtually all the spins point up in the same direction as the field. Okay? 
Now, this is the kind of behavior you would expect from a power magnet, so that's good. Okay, and I talked about this one in the last class. At low temperatures, the power magnet is in the ground state, which is all the spins pointing in the same direction as the field. As I increase the temperature, the power magnet becomes more disordered. You have more random sequence of spins, and as the temperature Ooh, this isn't right. Sorry, this is blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I've, in both cases, I've got the axes wrong. That's why it doesn't make any sense. Okay, this is the magnetization. What am I doing? Yeah, this is the, sorry. This is the magnetization as a function of field. This is the magnetization as a function of temperature. Sorry. But, but what I was saying is correct. At temperature equals zero, the magnetization is one. That means you're in the ground state. As the temperature goes to infinity, the magnetization tends to zero, which means that you're completely disordered. Okay. All right, that's now correct. Okay. Okay, part B is asking you to find the heat capacity, is a quantity we're going to be very interested in in the remaining of this course. And the heat capacity per spin I want to calculate. This is defined as 1 over n times how much does the energy change as a function of temperature. Okay, so how much energy do I need to change the temperature by a fixed amount? Right? This is the definition of heat capacity. Okay. Now, so we have this equation. U, we had, is it equal to the magnetization times the energy per spin, which is minus N mu H times M. This is minus N mu h times tanch mu h over kVt. So this is an expression for the energy of the magnet. <coughs> so to get the heat capacity, I just have to differentiate this at constant temperature. And if I divide by n, it just gets rid of that, right? Therefore, Cv, sorry, C, is equal to the ends cancel, so I get minus mu h times times the derivative with respect to temperature d by dt of tanch mu h over kVt. Okay, so that's derivative with respect to temperature, taking H as a constant. Okay, and the, the derivative rules for hyperbolic functions work more or less the same as they do for trigonometric functions. In particular, if I have d by dx of tanj x, then this is just 1 over cos hyperbolic cos squared x, which is exactly the same as for trigonometrical functions, right? The derivative of tan is 1 over cos squared. Okay. So using that result, here we get 1 over cos squared, so we get minus mu h times 1 over cosh, this is usually spoken cosh, cosh squared mu h over kBt multiply by the derivative of what's inside here with respect to temperature, which will give you minus mu h over kb t squared. Okay. Okay, and you can combine this into a nice form. If I, you see the minuses cancel. This is simply equal to Boltzmann constant times mu h 
over KBT divided by cosh of the same thing. All squared. So I can write the final result like that. Okay. If the temperature is very small, then this thing is very large, and cosh is an exponential, right? So this is enormous, and the set heat capacity goes to zero. So you have an exponential decay down here. It then rises up and meets some maximum point. But then if T becomes large, then this is approximately equal to 1. And therefore, this goes like 1 over T squared. Okay, so then it goes down like 1 over T squared. So it's like something like that. So for low temperatures, you have an exponential decay because of the cosh function there. And for high temperatures, it goes something like 1 over t squared. Okay. We can give you some idea of approximately what this is like. The maximum is independent of choice of h and so on or mu. It's always just about... 0.4 times the Boltzmann constant. So that's the maximum heat capacity of a power magnet per particle is about 0.4 times the Boltzmann constant. Okay. Okay. And the value down here, which it attains its maximum, is approximately 0.8 times mu h over kV. Now, the fact that the heat capacity has a maximum is unusual. If you look at most systems like gases and solids and so on, their heat capacity just tends to increase with temperature. So most systems, the heat capacity will just increase. But the power magnet shows a maximum. This is unusual. And for this reason, it's called a Schottky anomaly. Schottky is the guy who first named it, I think. And an anomaly is something which is unusual, right? So the fact that it has a maximum is unusual, so it's called an anomaly, and it's named after Schottky. Okay, Schottky anomaly. So it's given the symbol chi, and it's defined in the units I use, as the magnetic moment times the derivative of the magnetization with respect to the field at constant temperature. Okay, now this magnetite Magnetic susceptibility is a quantity which is very interesting to experimentalists. If you see what it says, if this thing is a large number, if the susceptibility is high, then a small change in the field will give you a big change in the magnetization. Okay. So if this number is high, small changes in the magnetic field make a big difference to the power magnet. Okay. Therefore, we say the power magnet is susceptible to changes in field, and that's why it's called susceptibility. On the other hand, if this thing is very small, then it means you have to change the field a lot in order to change the magnetization. So if this thing is small, then you have to have a very large magnetic field to improve the magnetization of the power magnet. Okay. So this is a measure of how easy the thing is to magnetize. Okay. If this number is big, it's very easy to magnetize the power magnet. If this number is small, it's very hard to magnetize the power magnet. Okay. And this is the formula for it. And because we know the magnetization, we can calculate this. So this is 
mu times d by dh, constant temperature of tanch mu h over kbt. And again, it's virtually the same as the heat capacity calculation, except now you're doing with respect to h rather than t. So this turns out to be mu over cosh squared mu h over kbt. That's the same. Multiply by the derivative with respect to h. That's mu over kbt. So our final answer, let me write it on a new bit of board. Final answer is that susceptibility is equal to mu squared, the magnetic moment squared over kbt times 1 over cos squared mu h over kbt. So again, let's plot some graphs of what this thing looks like, susceptibility as a function of field for fixed positive temperatures and susceptibility as a function of temperatures for fixed positive fields. Okay, and if you plot these functions, you get graphs that look something like this. It has some maximum here, then it decreases. So the susceptibility of a power magnet is maximum at zero field, and then it decreases as you increase the strength of the field. More interesting is the temperature, which looks something like this. This one, again, has some kind of maximum peak, and then goes down to zero. So again, we can understand this graph in a kind of intuitive way. When the temperature is zero, that means the power magnet is in the ground state. When the temperature is zero, that means all the spins already point up. So changing the field, making it stronger, doesn't change very much because you're already close to the ground state. Therefore, the susceptibility is low. Conversely, at high temperatures, high temperatures means the system is trying kind of random. Okay? So at high temperatures, you've got half the spins up, half the spins down, and increasing the field does not have a very large effect okay? because the temperature drives the system into this random configuration. Now, somewhere in between that, you have a maximum, you have a point where the susceptibility is the maximum, okay. where it's most susceptible to changes in field. So that's what the results look like. In particular, and to relate this to some real experiments, in particular interest is the case when the field is zero. If the field is zero, then cosh of zero is just one. So this term goes away. So the answer is just mu squared over kbt. Okay. And this result is known as Curie's law. It was discovered, I think, by Pierre Curie, the, wife, the husband of Marie Curie. And he discovered this law experimentally. Okay? So he was looking at paramagnetic materials, and he found that if he measured their susceptibility, then the susceptibility went like 1 over t. It was inversely proportional to temperature. Okay? So this was first discovered experimentally, but now, using statistical mechanics, using statistical physics, we can prove why the susceptibility is proportional to 1 over t. Okay? So this is an experimental result which later on was derived using theory. And this is the first result in this course where I show you how statistical physics can be used to derive experimental predictions. So this Curie's law was first discovered experimentally.
Okay, there's one more interesting point I want to make about this. The fact that chi at h equals zero is proportional to one over t. Okay? This means that you can use this as a thermometer. If I have a paramagnet and I measure its susceptibility, I know that that susceptibility is inversely proportional to temperature, and therefore by measuring its susceptibility, I can calculate the temperature. So paramagnets can, for this reason, be used as thermometers. And, and in fact, they are used as thermometers in various situations. Um, so what you do is say, I know that at room temperature, the susceptibility is something, let's say 2 or whatever. If I then measure it again, and I find that the susceptibility has doubled, now 4, then I know the temperature is half. Okay. If I find the susceptibility goes up to 8, then I know the temperature is a quarter, and so on. So by measuring the susceptibility, I can compute the temperature, and therefore we can use this as a thermometer. And this thermometer is particularly useful at low temperatures. So these paramagnets are used as thermometers in low temperature devices. It's particularly useful at low temperatures because it's inversely proportional to temperature. Okay, so the graph looks like this. At low temperatures, you get a big change in susceptibility for a small change in temperature. And therefore, it's a very precise measuring device. Okay, the last thing I want to do today is show you um, a presentation. This is Again, looking at the power magnet, but I've, I've got a computer to run a simulation. So this is the handout, and I'll talk about this now. OK, so what this is, is I wanted to show you how we can use these ideas from statistical mechanics to look at the interaction between two systems. You remember we talked about this last time, right? I take two systems, and I join them together, and then see how they interact. We can now consider a very simple example of this, where both of these systems are power magnets. Okay. And see how two power magnets interact. Okay. So we have two power magnets in a magnetic field. Their sizes are n1 and n2. I'll give these some numbers later. Now, because total energy is conserved, that means that the sum of the magnetization is fixed by the conservation of energy. In fact, that's not quite true. OK, the magnetizations can change because this, this power magnets can interact. But, OK, there's a mistake on this slide. What is constant is the N1, M1 plus N2, M2. This is a constant. OK, so it's not N1 plus M2, it's this. OK, sorry, that's a mistake on the slide. Let me make a note to change that. OK, so the magnetizations can change, but the total number of upspins and the total number of downspins should be the same, right? should stay the same. So how can the microstate change? Well, I suppose that the following thing is possible. If I have, in one power magnet, here's a spin up, and in another power magnet, here's a spin down, then they could choose to flip like this. Okay? So originally, power magnet 1 has a spin up, power magnet 2 has a spin down, and at some point in time, they can simultaneously spin, flip. Right? This main conserves the energy. Right? The energy of this power magnet goes up, the energy of this power magnet goes down, but total energy is conserved. Right? So we allow this spin flips like this to happen. OK, finally, at the bottom of this slide, you can see a model of the two power magnets. So I use blue arrows pointing up to denote upspins, 
red arrows denote down spins, okay? And here's N1, here's N2. Okay. Okay, so now I, in the second slide, I give some numbers. I suppose that the first power magnet is twice as long as the second. So the first power magnet is 1,000 spins, and the second power magnet has 500 spins. Okay. And we assume that the first power magnet is roughly half and half. Okay. So 520 point up. That's all these red ones here. Oh, no. Yeah. No, no, no. Sorry. 520 point up. That's the blue ones. Right. Blue ones point up. 520 point up and 480 point down. That's the first power magnet here. In the second power magnet, we assume it's in the ground state. The ground state means that all of the spins are pointing up. Okay. At the beginning. Right? So we then run the simulation, so we allow the spins to flip in, in the way that I described. So what do some things look like? Well, we can use this formula for the entropy to calculate the probability distribution of the magnetization at equilibrium. Okay? The way we do this is as follows. Okay. So I told you that the probability of having energy U1 is proportional to the number of ways of arranging the first power magnet with energy U1 times the number of ways of arranging the second power magnet with energy U2. So that's the probability, and of course, U1 is proportional to M1, and U2 is proportional to M2. So I can use this formula, and W is just the exponential of the entropy, which is this. So I can use this formula to calculate the probability. And if you do that, then you see this graph here. And the reason I made this graph is to show you the thermodynamic limit. So the average of M is about 0.35, okay? That's about, that means that about two-thirds of the spins are pointing up. And that's easy to understand because initially, in total, two-thirds of the spins point up. So after it's all became average, you'd expect two-thirds up in the first power magnet and two-thirds up in the second power magnet. So that's why this is the, the maximum here. But what's interesting is I plotted it for three different values of N1. If N1 is just 100, then you get this yellow curve, which is very wide. Okay? So there's a wide range of probabilities. If N is 1,000, then you get this curve here, which is sharper. If N is 10,000, then you get an even sharper curve. Okay? Now, this is the thermodynamic limit, which I mentioned in the last lecture, or maybe a week ago, we expect that as the number of particles becomes large, the probability distribution will become sharp. Okay? And therefore, the value of M1 becomes definite. And this is what I wanted to show you. Okay? So if N is small, then it's quite a wide distribution. But as N becomes large, it becomes sharp. In our case, we're at this case, right? M1 is 1,000. So that means we will have some width of possible values. So we expect M to take values between about 0.32 and about 0.4, this range of values. Okay, These are the graphs which I've drawn on the board. The entropy looks like this. You have high entropy at low magnetization and low entropy at high magnetization. Okay. And the temperature looks like this. Low temperature at high magnetization and high temperature at low magnetization. So, if I go back to the initial state, this second power magnet, this one, starts off with temperature zero. Okay? Because it has magnetization one, so it has temperature zero. So this one has temperature zero. The first power magnet is about half and half, so that means magnetization is nearly zero, so it starts off at very high temperature. So when we join these two power magnets together, the first one is at high temperature, and the second one is at low temperature. And you'd expect that the temperature should become equal. Right? This, is, this is what you expect to happen. Okay. 
So now I show the simulation. And if you look up here, you can hopefully see that some red bits are turning blue and some blue bits are turning red. These are the spin flips happening, right? So I got the computer to pick 800 spin flips. So it does this 800 times. And at the same time, I plot what's the magnetization of each power magnet. This is the second power magnet and the first power magnet. And what's the temperature of each power magnet? So I'll just let it run. So after 800 time steps, you end up with a situation where both of them look more or less the same. Okay? This in particular means that their temperatures have become more or less equal. So the first power magnet started off at high temperature. The second power magnet started off at low temperature. But at the end, the temperatures became equal. This is the right kind of behavior. Right? This is what we expect. And this means that their magnetizations become equal because temperature is a function of magnetization. That's one thing. Another thing you can see is that there are some fluctuations. If I look here, then the, temp the magnetizations became equal, but then there was a kind of small hump, a small deviation there, which is about of order 0.4. And th this, this bumpiness here, is due to the width of the distribution here. Okay? So because n is finite, there is a range of possible values of m. So even at equilibrium, you can find some noise. Okay, it goes up and down. So the larger n is, the smaller this noise is. So you can see these curves are a little bit noisy. If I took n to be a million, then they would get smoother. If I took n to be a billion, they would get even smoother. Okay. okay, so that's one observation. Another observation is about the entropy. We've got a formula for the entropy. Okay, so I made this last year where I used sigma for entropy, but Sigma is the same as S, okay? It's the same thing. I just used a different symbol. So this is the entropy of the first power magnet. This is the entropy of the second power magnet. So the entropy of the first power magnet goes down. The entropy of the second power magnet goes up. But what's important is that the total entropy increases. Okay? The entropy of the first plus the entropy of the second power magnet increases with time. And this is the statement of second law of thermodynamics. Right? The second law of thermodynamics says that these random changes in microstate should act to maximize the entropy. And you see here that that's exactly what happens. As the spin flips continue, the entropy, total entropy is maximized. So this slide is to demonstrate the second law of thermodynamics in this example. Finally, I will say that this simulation goes beyond the theory, right? Our theory, all of these things we've calculated, apply only in the equilibrium, right? This is only after a long time has taken place. So what these equations are able to calculate, sorry, is the end values. Okay? Using these equations, I could tell you what is the final temperature. I can calculate that, right? I can calculate what is the final magnetization. And I can calculate what is the final entropy. But the theory I have done is not sufficient to tell you the shape of these graphs. Okay? I can only tell you the final point. I can't tell you the shape of the graph. In order to calculate the shapes of graphs like these, you have to do non-equilibrium statistical physics. Okay? And as I said, we're not going to do that in this course. So in this course, I'm only going to be able to tell you what happens at the end. But this is a simulation which demonstrates all of the important points. The thermodynamic limit, the fact that temperatures become equal, and the fact that entropy is maximized okay, using a statistical model. So that's a good point to finish. That's the end of our theory of the power magnet. So from next week, we're going to go on to look at more complicated systems. And in two weeks' time, we're going to be able to calculate the properties of the ideal gas which is kind of the ultimate goal of this part of the course. Okay, so that's all for now.